run the King of Servers event, Dan, the four-person team tournament that I've been running now three years in a row as just an additional something to make the world's experience a little more special for everyone. And since Worlds this year ended on a was on a Saturday and Sunday, I had to I decided to start it beforehand. So it was kind of fun to start Worlds with my event on Thursday this year. Yeah. And uh, King of Servers was a blast this year. Was it a rec was it a record turnout this year? No, it's every year it's been capped on space, Dan. You know, I have it in these dank off-site uh, locations, basically VFW type halls or little um, gentlemen's clubs. Halls, yeah, exactly. Well, not gentlemen's clubs, but I wish. No, um, but it basically it's capped on size. So the first year was 128. The last two years it's been at this place called the BDL Club, so it's been capped at 160. And sadly, it was actually a little less this year because we had a number of last-minute cancellations. People have canceled their entire world's trips or part of it due to emergencies at home, sadly. Yeah. But it, but it, it was still great, right? I, it was fantastic. I had a blast, even though we got our butts kicked. It was great. <laughs> and I feel like having it before Worlds... The last time I went in 2015, it was after the main event of Worlds. Correct. So, actually, no, it was, it was before, it was before. It was before. The first one was before, and that's where people were getting a little gassed, and uh, that was where Timmy Wong spread his plague and got a lot of people sick at King of Servers, I think. And uh, last year was after World, so it was a little more laid back. We already had the world champ decided, and it was a different vibe. But this year, we had a day in between King of Servers and World, so I felt like it wasn't too stressed, right? Like, people had a day to decompress on Friday and play Icebreaker or whatever they wanted to do. Yeah. I think that's fair. And, you know, it's uh, it's really interesting to play that type of uh, fan tournament because mm -hmm. the stakes are lower and higher at the same time because, you know, it's a more laid-back kind of fun event, but it's also uh, an opportunity for people to kind of debut their decks and people who maybe don't have a chance, you know, as good of a chance of winning the big show because of the team nature and the smaller field have a better chance of really, you know, stealing a win at something like King of Servers. Even though we've had some back-to-back -back wins. Yeah, I would agree, Dan. And some people, to them, it's like, like you said, they may not feel like they have a shot individually in Worlds, but to them, the King of Servers then becomes more of their focus to try and win or place well in. And even then, like you said, it's kind of an interesting dichotomy. You know, you have some money involved at the higher end, but on the overall, it's a more casual vibe just because you can talk the whole time. I mean, people were taking, playing each other's games for them and uh, helping out. And, and um, also every year I've been trying to up, you know, the stakes of it, you know, just as a product like this year, I brought in some catered food, which everyone loved and had the prize wheel. So I try to add a little to it every year. Yeah, it was definitely a fantastic event. But we're not necessarily here to specifically talk about King of Servers. We're here primarily to talk about the Corp deck that you took uh, and made it into the top 16 with at uh, 2017 Worlds, which is uh, controlling the message. I haven't heard much about that ID. Is that ID good? I've never... No, it's uh, it's rarely used. I don't think it was ever. Did it ever do well in the tournament? I don't think so, Dan. No, you don't think so. But yeah. No. So it, but it, it it has kind of more recently. You know, over the summer, people were talking about how it's dead, and then it kind of made a resurgence before and during Worlds. So let's talk talk to me a little bit about how you came to play this, and what we're trying to do here. Sure. Um, it was kind of accidentally, like you said, this summer it suffered a lot before we changed the meta because I think it suffered a lot of splash damage from moons being in the environment. And as a result, there were so many people on wizard and other asset spam hate that CTM suffered accordingly, whether it's employee strike or slums or maw or wizard, all of those tools at Gen Con would have destroyed this deck. So until we had a change in the meta, I don't think it was good. And then even like account siphon, you think of like DLR decks. I mean, there are right. a number of tools that killed it. Right. So controlling the message finally got to feel what e Wayland feels where nerves <laughs> to other decks or tech for other decks hurts you more. 
Exactly, and those those that's always sad part of the game. You know, the uh, collateral damage for decks that already were suffering. So basically, to answer your question, I kind of happened upon it because for our testing group, we started around the end of September, getting ready for Worlds. Sure. For our gauntlet, we decided we needed a yellow deck or two, and I had a Soul Glacier that I've been massaging for months now. But then I thought, I think CTM has something to it, and I just built one on a whim. And it actually performed decently. And I said, well, if we tune this up, it could actually be good. Nice. So where do you want to start as far as the discussion of the card choices? Well, the original version I came up with, and I played it on my stream back when I was doing the top deck tournament, was a boom ver version. Mm -hmm. And the idea being, um, even against like Maw or Ed Kim, the idea is you had archive memory so you could just kill them. You know, you just like eventually get them in a tag storm, you'd grab the boom out of archive and kill them. And I decided to move away from kill because it wasn't consistent enough and I wanted to just go with something more glaciery. So let's look at the agendas. To me, what put me on the stand is Ares, AR Enhanced Security. That card is so good. Yeah, I, that is what actually to me brought this identity back into the fold. Yeah, if, if somebody's not a link based runner, it's like an CTM becomes an automatic two tags when they mm -hmm. trash something. Exactly. And even a link based runner has to eat these tags or like against Ed Kim, if they're attacking the hand. Oh, it feels so good. Yeah. Cause they, cracked. cause they can't control whether or not they trash those operations automatically. And it's a, it, what I love about this too, it's a card from anywhere, not unlike the identity, which is installed. So if they're hitting from, you know, the decks, the hand on the board, it's smashing them. Now, the Comrades version, which did well as well, they only they did a flip. They only ran one of these in 3 QPM, but the, the way I like to play this deck, Dan, I like to go extremely fast and then slow down. So I like to rush this uh, agenda out as quick as possible to set the pace of the game. Yeah, and I think that's 100% reflective of what we saw at top tables, where um, oftentimes uh, some people being bold enough to rush out and score one of these early's ulti ultimately dictates the pace of the late game totally like i mean more than once in the tournament dan i did the classic shuffle three cards and randomly install them in remotes as my first turn and the idea is do you want to risk running these maybe you'll hit a virtual tour maybe you'll get the agenda but or maybe you'll get hard hitting so i feel like you have to move quick and just be ballsy yeah so in addition to that, we also have a single 15 minutes. Oh, yeah, that was a Jesse Vandover edition, and it was great. I was on 2 QPM, but this agenda, Dan, just does so much work. It's You can fast advance to get rid of a current, like, hacktivist, and you can also EOI it. You can exchange it and then shuffle it back in. That feels awesome, so it's really good. You got GFI, not surprising, in a Tag Storm build. Yep, that's the restricted card. It slows down their win con while accelerating yours when you exchange it. Yeah, very good. And then we got Beal. Um, Beal's good. Yeah, uh, Dan, I don't uh, I don't think this would work without it. Like, if this wasn't rotated back in, I don't think it'd work. And what this gives you is three more GFIs or better with Psychographics, which is great. It also, yeah, and it's also something you can never advance. Yes, that's a key way to play this deck is never advanced glacier. So this is an awesome tool for that. Yeah. And then as you mentioned, QPM, which is a fine, fine agenda for yellow. Yeah, if you're playing Data Raven, your QPM is awesome. In King of Servers, uh one of my teammates, Sanjay, was uh counter surveillanced for fourteen cards. <laughs> and his opponent saw two quantum predictive models. Oh. And that was it. Ouch. It was pretty good. It felt great. That does feel good. And that's why I think that the Comrades build was on that, because they just wanted to close with those. And I understand that. Yeah. So let's talk about assets. You know, mm -hmm. we're going to be installing things in remotes, I would imagine, from time to time. Yeah, that's definitely a game plan in this deck. So we have two commercial bankers. So talk to me a little bit about two of these instead of three of these, which more you know, historic builds of CTM would have. Yeah, Dan, that's, I mean, you got a few judgment calls with the influence. At 12 influence, the identity is so tight and it's hard. Um, I had three at the last minute. I dropped one for the Wampo. We can talk about in a second. I just felt like the Wampo would give me a little more versatility and I wouldn't have to run preemptive action as a result. 
That's fair. Yeah. And and these also die very easily. Like if they can come at these early and it, oh, just shake the tag and you don't have the hard hitting, then you feel bad. Yeah. We got three daily business shows. They're it's no sensey's actors union, but I'll tell you what, Dan, these win games. These keep the hand clean in a long game and the people who didn't trash these generally lost. Yeah. I'd say Daily Business Show even more so than the money a lot of times is the must trash asset of this deck. Right, but at four a uh, four trash cost, it's very difficult for a runner to swallow. Yeah. So I remember when we were at the tournament, you had mentioned uh, in a conversation uh, that I was a part of that the Maryland campaigns were one of the MVPs of this build. Talk to me a mm. little bit about it. Yeah, definitely. Um I've seen some people, when you're talking about uh, bankers, I've seen people drop two of these, run one Maryland and three bankers, but I love this card, Dan, because you're talking one influence, you're talking with the two res, it's going to pay for itself instantly if you can you know, just get one hit out of it. Three trash, people don't like the trash at three, I found, rarely, and it shuffles back in. It's right. the perfect never advance. I've, I've resed it. And immediately overwritten it, shuffle it back in, and just keep that never advance game going. It's it's a fantastic card. Yeah, and if they try, yeah, right. And if they trash it while rezzed, you're like, meh, okay. Yep. All right, so you do have one of Wampoa, which is mm -hmm. a really fine asset spam card for again getting stuff to the bottom of the bin. How often would you find that you're um, recycling tools as opposed to agendas? Uh, you know, it depends on the board state. If you get this later in the game and DBS has been keeping your hand clean, you're generally going to throw back those um, operations that you want to hit them with again. And I like that you can you get two uses out of it immediately. And if you protect it with an ice or on a virtual tour, you can keep it up a long time. But generally, Dan, I only use it to fix agendas out of the hand early game. Sure. That makes sense. All right. So, we can't talk about controlling the message without talking about virtual tours. Because that's kind of the the anchor that gives this deck license to soar, right? Like, this is a, such a strong card for this build. So, um, I think when I watch less skilled players play this deck, something that comes up a lot is people don't know how to read the board and know where to put these. Can you talk a little bit about how you evaluate where to put these in different stages of the game versus different identities, et cetera? Yeah, it's it's really tough. Even I sometimes find a hard play, time and place to use these. Being an upgrade is fantastic because they can go anywhere. You can even overwrite a Maryland campaign and make it look like you just jammed an agenda if you want. Right. Or you can stack two of these in the remote. If you have a good feeling they're going to come in that remote and we'll have the money, you can back break them with two of them there uh likewise you can use them to protect key assets like a bankers that can't protect itself or a daily business but finally they're just great on the centrals if you put one down let's say an r d you're worried about them coming in it's basically it's a hard tell that that's a virtual tour but on the other hand it's like you're putting it in it. the runner's mind they have to eat it at some point right eventually they're gonna have to deal with it yeah it may it may delay a run or two yeah, and I remember discussions, um, you know, where people discuss this card, and people are like, oh, you can always go down to four bucks. I'm like, oh yeah, mm -hmm. you can just go down to four bucks sure. against yellow. That'll, yeah. that'll never, that'll work out for you. Yeah, just get hard hitting news. That's all. Yeah. All right. So let's talk a little bit about the ops because you have a little bit of a spicy build. Some things mm -hmm. that we would definitely expect, but some things in a little bit of higher numbers that maybe we some of our viewers wouldn't expect we have one biased reporting which is a fine card um a lot of people who are playing runners that are playing a certain type of card strangely seem to be playing a lot of that type of card yeah definitely it's uh like it's one reason why like scarcity is so good because there are a lot of runners as you know who play a ton of one type usually resource and that's why i just have a one of for two credits, you can get a huge boost, and that could maybe give you a nice C source. Um, and I, Dan, I use this at least three times in the tournament for double-digit returns, which is fantastic as far as I'm concerned, especially these Haley decks. One person gave me, I think, 14 or 16. It was like, okay, I'll take it. So yeah. 
I had two of, I dropped it to a one of to go to a second closed accounts. I thought that was a little more useful. Yeah, I mean, yeah, bias reporting is really strong. Um, Sanjay landed one of these against the uh, Hammer Party Kim deck in King of Server. Mm. That's uh, only resources and or and Oracle May. Okay, <laughs> that's fantastic. How much did you get? A lot. It was. <laughs> I think it was over twenty dollars. <laughs> <laughs> and you know, if you look at it though, it's a really balanced card. It's not useful early. It requires. Right skill and the runner can trash their things so right but what it really does is it really punishes people for going all in on one type of card totally all right so we have two closed accounts a lot of as you mentioned a lot of you know older builds for ctm or yellow are running only maybe one talk mm -hmm. to me a little bit about why you dropped the bias reporting and went to the two closed accounts okay um so basically aaron andrews and i both played ctm and he wanted to he called this kind of more it's kind of you know oxymoronic to call it a speed ctm deck but the idea is you kind of gas pedal out early and you're going to force some um tough decisions and as opposed to some builds that play more asset spammy dan like you may have seen like with pad campaigns or nas x we decided to go more of the operation route and the reason to run two of these dan is because you want the combo when you need it the combo being c source closed accounts hard-hitting news and that combination if you land that mid-game especially against like shapers at misdirection is basically a hard gg yeah yeah i like it a lot and c source is something that basically no one except for geist can deal with right now because almost no runners have the ability to clear tags on the corpse turn Exactly. I mean, they took a lot of that out of the game. So you see Geist is a problem, right? Because they can have Forger and on the lamb. But outside of Geist, no one else, everyone else is getting slammed. And, you, and at some point, you, you should be able to out-money them and do it. Yeah. And then we've got exchange of information, which is just a staple of this build. Um, usually, probably exchanging, what, QPMs in 15 minutes, or really probably any one-pointer for Global Foods. Yep, pretty much any one-pointer for a global food or a beal, even if need be, Dan, um, if you're desperate. But uh, it's it's this is the, how the deck fast advances. It fastly advances the card yep. from their side to yours. Yeah, fast advances, fast exchange. Fast exchange. So we have the card that basically goes hand-in-hand -hand with controlling the message, which is hard-hitting news. It's in Got a lot of decks right now, right? I mean, Waylon runs this. Um, certain CIs run it. Yep, exactly. It's a fine card, and it's very well designed, in my opinion. I agree. The fact that it's a terminal gives them a turn to get out from under it. And uh, for two influence, you can see it splash. And if you run less than three, you can't threaten it. So, Yeah. We got money for money. Seems mm -hmm. good. We got one psychographics, as you mentioned, um, to turn a Beal into a, uh, a GFI or more. Yep. Yeah, or even good. just push a GFI out. Uh, that's if they decide to go desperately and go tag storm or against the clan arc decks that tag themselves. You want to punish them. Oh, yeah. That's one of the other things I saw. I didn't see this in any of the games that you had played, but other people who were on CTM at the tournament, the stress that being against CTM puts those clan arc decks because they're mm -hmm. just hoping that you don't find the psychographics because they don't have a lot of cred denial. Yep, exactly. Um, I played against White played round seven. He was not only clan arc I played, but he was smart. He kept himself on five. I actually, I mean, I pushed an agenda of a GFI out with one of these, but by not gaining more than five tags, he wasn't going, you know, he couldn't get auto wins. Right. Yeah, and that's smart. Very smart. I feel like a lot of people with the uh, God of War, they get very greedy. Oh, yes. About getting that... max counter surveillance value. Yeah, they want that 20 or whatever. But, it, I mean, even five at a time, Dan, is a super deep dig. Yeah. Do you right. want to talk uh, C-Source real quick, a value C-Source? Have you heard this? Aaron Andrews came up with this in the middle of the tournament. Yeah, talk to Val me about it. Value C-Source. So, basically, there was a lot of Tapworm in the tournament, right? Mm-hmm. And against Tapworm, like this deck, you know, you can make a lot of money if they set up. All of a sudden, they dropped a Tapworm with three sack cons. Even if you purge for four turns, they're going to pull in a lot of money while you're doing nothing. It's a terrible feeling, right? It's an awful feeling that I put a lot of corpse into during the tournament. Yeah, exactly. So what happens, Aaron decided was, I mean, he's on whatever, 20 or 30, 20-some 20 credits. 
the guy ran because you have to run to install, put down the tapworm, and this requires a successful run. So he basically traced out for almost all of his money, vamping himself down, and the runner had to decide, do I just pay down or do I risk to close the counts? So you're vamping both parties, and then it gives you enough turns to purge while you're at no money, giving them nothing. So I, I love the idea of like self-vamping yourself with the seesaws. Neat. That's a really cool play. I like that a lot. All right, so let's talk ice. Uh, there's not a ton of surprises here. Surprises here. We have uh, three IP blocks. I'm a, uh, the turtle is everywhere. Mm -hmm. uh, and when they go tag me, they have to pay. You yeah, know, they, they have to. That second sub is always on. Yeah, resistor is much the same. If people decide to go tag me, they have to deal with it unless they're a trace run, a link runner. Yeah, if they're a link runner, God help you. Yeah, uh, you've got Archangel, which man, this is like the value sapper. Uh, I did a couple test games today at lunch of, with this build, and the number of just like cheese plays I got with people striking this in my hand was so good. Mm -hmm. Exactly. That's usually the best place for this, unless you're desperate, is to keep it in HQ. Yeah, I I picked up a um, a off campus apartment and it felt incredible. <laughs> wow. Uh, so we got two toll booths. I imagine this is your late game remote and what probably R and D like slow down ice. Yeah, and just a nice hard lock, Dan. Um, it, to me, it's one of my favorite cards in the game. It's been powerful from the core set. It's still good. And we had an information overload, but that was more of a t fun toy. Whereas this just always works, always taxes outside of a femme fatale. It's just a great piece of ice. Yeah. And then we've got, again, a uh, controlling the message staple card, best friend, Theta Raven. Totally helps turn on IP block hard to come back through and even with the amount of hunting grounds that was out there myself playing it included hard to come back through it more than once a turn yeah yeah i mean this is incredibly solid uh this just looks very lean and tight and it's very focused on as you said leveraging some of the very powerful events in nbn exactly yeah this is we i mean we trimmed a lot of fat from this we felt like this was pretty pretty tight of a pretty tight deck dan yeah well spags as always thank you very much for coming on sure we're Thanks gonna take me. we're gonna take it for a spin on test run and until we see you all there always be running